How many of you have seen the newest TV live drama show, The Briefcase? I got one. That's it? Really? Two, three. All right. I actually watched, um, you can watch it online, actually, if you want to go watch it after you hear about it this morning. But the story is, it just aired, the, the first episode just aired this past Wednesday, and the the understanding of the show or the, the, the basis of the show is they have two families and each family gets a briefcase, right? The producers of the show, they're told that they're going to be on a documentary about financial um, understanding and how families live out finances in the world today, right? We can all relate to that kind of stuff. How do you handle money and use your money? So they thought they were going to be on this documentary about this. And then when the producers walk into their house, they set down a briefcase on the table and they tell them, when you're ready to open this briefcase, I want you to open it up and whatever is inside of it is yours. Inside of the briefcase, when the families open it up, is $101,000. The families are told that they can do whatever they want to with the money. They can decide to keep it, all of it, or they can decide to give it away, and if they give it away, it goes to another family that is in just as big a need as they are. Unbeknownst to these two families, this is happening to both of them at the exact same time, and if one family gives the money away, it goes to the other family that's getting the briefcase. It's an interesting concept, right? What would you do if somebody came to you and gave you a briefcase full of money and said, what do you want to do with it? Are you going to keep it? Or are you gonna well you can't donate it to the church. You gotta donate see that's when I first heard the, the commercials about it, I was like, Oh cool, they're gonna bring me a hundred thousand dollars and I can do whatever I want to with it. I can keep like twenty thousand, I can give, you know, forty thousand to the church or fifty thousand or sixty thousand to the church, and then I can give, you know, however much to the to the, the pastor wouldn't have a heart attack, it'd be okay. But you have to give the money and if you give the money away it goes to the other family, right? So that's the, that's the impetus of the story. But what would you do? What would you do if you found out that you had a rich uncle or aunt that passed away and you became the sole inheritor for their estate? All of your financial concerns from here to the point of future, to any point in the future, and the financial concern of all of your children is completely taken care of. Because this rich aunt or uncle has died and left you everything that they owned. You have no financial concerns ever again. What would you do? Now, what would you go out and buy? Because that's probably exactly where all of our minds are. Okay, if I just got a bunch of money, what am I going to go buy? Well, I'm good. I got a couple people going. No. How would your life change if you knew you didn't have to worry about any financial concerns from here forward? How would your life change? Retire? <laughs> Would you be more generous? Would you... It's hard to say because it's a, it's a scenario that most of us will never have to worry about, right? We don't have, most of us don't have rich uncles or aunts that are going to pass away. Most of us don't have rich uncles and aunts that we even know about that are going to pass away and then leave us a bunch of money. Because if we don't know about them, they probably don't know about us. So, it's probably not going to happen. But, we do have something that sets us up even greater than knowing about all our financial concerns are taken care of. Right? Paul says to the Romans, For you did not receive a spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but you received a spirit of adoption. You received the spirit of adoption. And who adopted you? Who adopted you? It happened. We had one right here last week. God did. When we cry, Abba, Father, it is that very spirit bearing witness to our spirit that we are children of God. Right? You are set up for the rest of your existence with the greatest uncle that you could ever have. Or the greatest father you could ever have. And it's not just that good, it goes on, right? And, it, and think about this. And it's children that heirs, heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ. Joint heirs with Christ. You are sharing everything of God's kingdom equally 
with Jesus Christ, God's one and only Son. Not He gets 60% and you get 40%. Equal. Co heirs with Jesus Christ. Think about that for a moment. How should that change the way that we live our lives? How should that change the way that we act in the world knowing that not only are we God's children, but we are going to be co inheritors? But we are co inheritors with Jesus Christ, of everything that God has to give to God's one and only Son, who He gave up so that we could be with God. And that same Son tried to convince Nicodemus to look at things in a different way, to look at things outside the box, to think about things in a way that don't necessarily make sense to us, right? Because you have to be born from above. And how does a person be born again or born from above? Can a person enter a second time into their mother's womb and be born again? See, the problem with that is, is we try to wrap our minds around that and make it be something that we do. How many of you had a choice when you were born? How many? None of us had any choice at all in our physical birth. None of us have a choice even on our spiritual birth. That's God's doing. As Martin Luther said in the third article of the Apostles' Creed, I cannot, by my own understanding, except through the power of the Holy Spirit, come to believe in God. So the only way that you can believe in God is if God allows you to believe in Him, or if God empowers you to believe in Him. Martin Luther said that. It's God working in and through us that allows us to see God and know who God is and know that God has adopted us as children. Which brings us back to that thing living inside of us, right? I told the kids the story of the eagle and the chicken, which is actually an interesting story. The eagle looking up, the eagle looking up, and seeing the eagle soaring in the sky and not understanding that he's also able to do that because the chicken's telling, well, you're just a chicken, and you can't do that. Right? That spirit living in us, though, is the one that gives us the power to do the things that we don't think we can do, and the people around us telling us we can't do. Which brings us to what the day is. Does anybody know what today is? Besides Sunday, besides May 31st. It's a, it says on the front of your bulletin, if you look at your bulletin. <laughs> it's Holy Trinity Sunday, and who understands the Trinity? I could stand up here and give you all kinds of neat uh, analogies of the Trinity, right? There's an egg which has a shell and a white and a yolk, um, but that's actually a heresy called modalism, um, which means that God can be put into three separate entities where an egg can exist. I can have an egg shell, or I can have an egg white, or I can have an egg yolk, I can have them all separate, or I can have all three of them together. Apple, I have the skin, the fruit, and the seed, right? Again, modalism. All three of them can exist separately, but they can exist together. Augustine, one of the early church fathers, said that the understanding of the Trinity is a mystery. We can't possibly understand it. But here's the thing that we can understand about the Trinity. The reason that we talk about God as three in one and one in three is because there's no way to talk about God except in relationship. The Trinity is three. And they're in a constant ebb and flow, moving in and out of each other. We cannot have one without the other. We cannot have Jesus without having Spirit and Father. We cannot have Father without having Jesus and Spirit. We cannot have Spirit without having... All three are there together. Not separate, but always together. Living in a relationship. How many of you have ever been in my office? I have several different pictures, icons, of this one little icon. It's the icon of the Holy Trinity. And the reason that I love it is because it shows us that God is in a relationship. You can't see it very well. I'll leave it up here. You can look at it. I'll pull it to the back so you can see it a little bit better. But it's three, right? Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Three together, three in one. The thing that I love about this, though, is that the fact that the, the Trinity is three and God is three in one is that there's always room for one more. 
and that the Trinity was actually designed to make that room. Because if you look at this very closely, when you see it, there's an opening down here. It's not a closed triangle or a closed circle. It's open because you are God's plus one. And He wants you to be involved in His life and in His relationship. In the Trinity that's three, there's always room for one more. In the math of God, I'm going to confuse our kids that have four days left of school. In the math of God, three plus one equals one. Tell your math teacher that. Three, right, Trinity, is one, but three plus one equals one. God plus you is one. And God wants you to be His plus one for all of eternity. Because there's always room in this relationship for you and for everyone else. That's what Paul was telling the Romans. That's what Jesus was telling Nicodemus. God is a relationship. And He wants to be in that relationship with you. So knowing that no matter what happens in your life, no matter what you do, no matter where you go, God is always going to be with you and seeking after you and wanting you to be a part of Him. How does that change the way you're going to look at your life? How does that change the way that you're going to interact with the things around you? How does that change the way that you are going to be a light of Christ shining in the, in the world? A light on a hill, salt to the earth the hands and feet of Jesus to show everyone His love and invite them into this relationship. Because not only are we His plus one, but all of the world can be God's plus one. So go and help everyone see that in God's relationship there's always room for one more.